Shalom Kharim. It is an eventful day, we might say. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to just congratulate uh, Mr. Reuven Rivlin, who is the new president of Israel, uh, mostly a symbolic uh, office. But I really like him because he opposes any two-state solution and says Israel cannot be divided. So God bless him. Um, I've read some articles here where uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu at one time was opposing his candidacy but did endorse him. Uh, they both come from the Likud party. And, and I could probably see why. I know uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been under a lot of pressure uh, with all this nonsense that the Vatican is doing and, and the pressure that goes on there. And there's a lot of uh, politicians uh, in Israel. I say a lot. Uh, you know, I guess it really depends on what we would call a lot. But there are certainly, um, and maybe I can just type this in just to see, Israeli politicians uh, that support uh, two states. Um, but, you know, you have Ms. Lavini, uh, a cabinet minister, uh, who is part of the negotiation team that was very much in favor of a two-state solution. Um, and, and, and throughout all of the, the debates here, uh, we have seen several other Israeli politicians who are in favor of the two-state solution. And uh, I can't really find that as of right now. But, but I, intend, I, I do intend to put some of this together for you. I want you to see that there is a divide. There are those in the Israeli government that whatever it takes to achieve peace, they're willing to compromise the land of Israel. But we have great leaders, especially upcoming leaders, such as the president, Stan, the new president here, uh, Ravine, who is against uh, the two-state solution. You have uh, Naftali Bennett, who is also a cabinet minister, uh, the housing cabinet minister for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is who is very vocal against uh, the two-state solution. Uh, he he kind of walks a little bit of a fine line, but I, I would imagine if you put him uh, on, on a different level where he could run, say, for prime minister, uh, we would see that uh, he would drop this two-state solution altogether. <clears throat> Nonetheless, though, uh, I have certainly inflamed uh, some people in my comments on the video that I recently uh, put out. Uh, in fact, it inflamed so badly that a lot of false accusations have been spread about us as well. Uh, nonetheless, as I said to you, and, and, and I put up a video about my DNA uh, that proves that yes, indeed, we are, or I am Jewish. Uh, I say we because my wife's Jewish as well. Um, and, you know, one thing I didn't include is the thousands, I mean, literally thousands of Holocaust victims that are in our family, both from my mother's side and my father's side. Um, uh, some of you guys did make, uh, make mention that you were having a hard time seeing it, I guess, maybe a smaller screen. It is, it, I did notice that my, because I'm, I was filming from the computer itself, uh, and it makes it difficult. So what I did is I screen captured some of these things that I showed you so that you'll be able to see a clear picture now. I'll, I'll share that with you. Uh, so it lets you see that clearly, uh, especially the, the exact match that I have from uh, a, a man uh, by the last name of Roth. That's actually the family name he was known by, but you'll notice on the screen, he's actually, his last name is Levi. And uh, he wrote me the letter uh, stating that, you know, because of different persecutions down through the years, we've changed religions and everything else. Uh, but we're actually Levites. Uh, and he goes to a Chabad um, shul himself and has Levitical pri uh, pri privileges there. Anyway, uh, let's get right off of that, though, because what my concern is, is what's taking place. And I I've had some letters also of concern because uh, one sister, precious sister, wrote me and she said, uh, Brother Steve, I, I, uh, I was a little concerned because... Uh, I always believed you to be a pre-trib uh, person, and uh, uh, it concerned me when I'm watching this video that it seems like that you're mid-trib. Um, 
I was talking to Brother Aaron, the brother that, uh, is, that manages our website, about that. And um, uh, I forget how Brother Aaron put it, uh, convenient trip or something like that. Or, or <laughs> Brother Aaron, I may get that wrong. But anyway, the point is, I want him to come just as quickly as he possibly will come. Uh, but those of you that do watch the videos, you know that I've never really fully said one way or the other as far as a rapture. I do believe in a rapture, but let me clear this one up. Uh, you can knock post-rapture uh, or post-tribulation rapture completely out of the water. There's not anything that suggests that that I can see. Uh, now, I do know the different arguments of different camps that believe different things. And each person, if you take and just read the argument for their reasoning for post-trip or mid-trip or pre-trip, every one of the arguments seem very convincing. That's not the purpose of the video. What I am trying to get people to realize is that the things that are happening in Israel, clearly at the tomb of David, where the Jewish people, the, the Jewish sisters that go there to pray, the Jewish men that go there to pray, even the rabbi that is over that were thrown out so that the Catholic people could come and hold a mass inside the tomb. Now, according to rabbinate law, once you have an idolatrous act going on, this place could no longer be used. So is this being done intentionally to cause the Jewish people not to be able to go anymore into the tomb of David and to be able to pray where they normally do go and pray? <laughs> My point that I see clearly, the Vatican has been given rights to Mount Zion far further reaching than what anybody has been told. Um, the rabbi that was there, he's been quoted on the news. Anyone can see the news sources. Uh, all you have to do is read uh, the Italian journalist who also writes for Israel National News, Giulio Miotti, also a friend of ours as well. Uh, he has been reporting on this the entire time that you're about to see the Vatican do a lot more and take control of a lot more than what you realize. This covenant, this is not a two-state solution. This is the Vatican trying to get control. Now, I wanted to go back into this subject again, and the reason I did is because what has really taken place? 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people, my own people, were exiled as a result of the rejection of Yeshua. Now, there are some people that are, that are gullible enough to believe that that wasn't the reason why. We have never gone into exile unless there was sin. And I know that there's even, uh, amongst my own Jewish brothers and sisters that do believe they make the mistake of trying to blame everything on Rome. Well, they say, well, Rome killed Yeshua. Yes, Rome did do the crucifixion. There's no doubt about it. But by the laws of God that Moses wrote, that God gave Moses, God had Moses and the elders of Israel go out and smite the rock that it would bring forth its waters. So Israel had to smite Yeshua. Even Yeshua himself says, this, the shepherd will be smitten, the sheep will be scattered. So he was smitten. Now, Israel is guilty of the smiting and to deliver him up for the crucifixion. We can't get out of that. In fact, the sooner we begin to recognize our offense to God, the sooner God's mercy will be upon us. So we smote him and gave him over to the Romans to be crucified. When we claim, we cried out, our forefathers, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. That wasn't a curse. That was actually a blessing because his blood atoned for our sins for the next 2,000 years, especially in light of the fact that there was no temple service, there was no sacrifices being offered. We needed some kind of sacrifice to atone for the sins of Israel for the next 2,000 years. So yes, just like it was in the case of Joseph, 
Joseph's brothers took and killed the little goat. They took the blood, they poured it on, on the coat of their brother, and they take it back to Jacob, and they said, is this not discern? Is this not your son's coat? And he broke down weeping. He said, yes, it is. It is. It's his. He's been torn by a wild beast. Had God not accepted the blood sacrifice of that goat that they sacrificed upon his coat, God would have wiped out ten of the tribes. Now, ironically, Benjamin was not partaker in this, but when Joseph does reveal himself to his brethren, he puts his own cup in Benjamin's bag, doesn't reveal himself to him quite yet, sends them back on their way to the journey, and what happens? He has his servant overtake them and say, why have you done evil to, your, to my master? Stealing his cup. Wow. They start from the oldest and go all the way to the least. And when they open up Benjamin's bag, there the cup is. The innocent brother, but the, you know, it's a twofold purpose. God knows that the Benjamites in the future, which would be part of the tribe of Judah, was going to cry out for the blood of Yeshua. So he puts it there showing that they're going to reject Yeshua at the communion table, just as Judas did. Now, Judas was not a Benjamite, but it was still, they had went and the Levites had put the children of Israel of that day, the, uh, the house of Judah, which were the Benjamites, up to denying him and falsely accusing him and crying out for his blood. So what are you going to do about it? The other thing is, is the cup is put in Joseph's bag for what? It's to tell the Jews of today, we were guilty, though we were not there, though we were innocent, we were not the ones that put him on the cross. You know, we like to pass the buck. The Romans did it. You know, that's the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. You know, God comes to Adam when, it, when Eve tells the truth of what happened. And God comes to Adam and he said, the woman you, or excuse me, he comes to Adam first. He says, and he says, the woman you gave me, she did it. He's not man enough to take responsibility for his actions. At least Eve tells the truth. She said, the serpent came and, and he gave me and I did eat. He beguiled me. You know, he deceived me. She, she was, she's actually the only one that tells the truth in the matter. Adam just is scared. He wants to get it off his hands. So this is what we have with Israel. You know? And don't tell me I'm condemning my own people. The thing is, is I love my own people. I'm trying to get them to wake up and we got to recognize where we've made our mistakes. Clearly, in, in, in the prophecy of Zechariah, Zechariah 12, you know, you know, Ezekiel, by the way, Ezekiel prophesies of the house of Israel being restored, right? Um, and says that they're dry bones and said all of our hope is lost, and, but yet God raises them up a mighty army. That's the house of Israel. It has nothing to do with the house of Judah. But ironically, according to Zechariah chapter 12 here, he says here in the 10th verse, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they uh, have pierced. Uh, some the Jews mostly translate that as thrust through. I actually think it's not speaking of the piercing of his hands and feet, but I think it is thrust through. I think it's when the Roman soldier threw, shoved that spear in his side. That's really where I think that comes in at. Um, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, he says here, uh, and, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as in the morning, uh, morning of Hadron, Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and the wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. By the way, that's the tribe of Judah. Both of them are from the tribe of Judah. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. That's the Levites, of course, that were there, the, the uh, Pharisees of, of Yeshua's day that were guilty of uh, condemning Yeshua. And uh, their wives apart, and the family of Shemai. Shemai is a tribe of Benjamin, just like we know in the story of David from the book of Kings. What did, this, what did David do in the story of the book of Kings there? David, when he was going over and he wept over Jerusalem as he's leaving, because he was what? Rejected. Uh, Absalom, 
uh, Absalom, uh, actually his name Absalom is, the, is his actual name in Hebrew, but uh, Absalom, he was um, David's son that never recognized that his father was truly the right heir to the kingdom, and he exalts himself as his father was getting older to be king over Israel uh, through a false, uh, a false deal there. The people fell for it, and David, rather than letting his men kill him, uh, he takes and has mercy, and he tells his men, we'll leave. They go over, onto the, uh, uh, over uh, across the Kidron Valley, up on the Mount of Olives. They, he weeps over Jerusalem, uh, and, and just like Yeshua did. And on his way up the hill, as they're leaving the country there, uh, Shimei, one of Saul's sons, come out throwing rocks at David and his men cursing them. And uh, David's man said, let me cut that dog's head off his body. But David said, let him alone. The Lord has told him to do this. Now, so it's no strange thing that when God speaks about Zechariah and he says the family of Shimei, he's bringing out Shimei as a Benjamite for a reason. Now, ironically, in the story of David, when David does come back, he has the two uh, priests that stayed behind like two witnesses he they got the people in one mind and one accord to receive David with one heart as the Bible says now David as he's getting ready to come back uh, a very interesting thing happens Shemai meets him at the river in full apologetic mode another interesting thing that happens as well was David was weeping bitterly at the death of his son Absalom and I always thought that was kind of strange. Why would he weep so much over Absalom? In fact, he makes a comment. He said, I would to God that I could have died in your, in, in your place. Well, he was, a, he was playing out the perfect type of Yeshua. And what David could not do, Yeshua could do. David wanted, wished he could have died for his son and not his son have to die. And David's men could have easily put down the rebellion. When Yeshua was here, and, and, and Peter cut off the ear, uh, the ear of the high priest's servant, he could have easily put down the rebellion of all the priests that were coming after him to take his life, but he said, put away your sword. Could I not call ten legions of angels right now if I wanted of my father? But it wasn't the hour. So David was doing for Israel. See, Israel was that type there. Israel was rejecting Yeshua as being that he was God himself there. And so Yeshua did what David only spoke about prophetically. He did give his life for them. So in this case here, the Benjamites were crying out for his blood, just like Shimei was crying out against David, cursing him and everything. But when David comes back, Shemai realizes he had done wrong and repents. That's why we're seeing the story here in Zechariah. When Yeshua does return, they're going to look upon him whom they thrust through, whom they pierced. And that may very well mean the hands and the feet. I'm not saying that it doesn't. I, I, I bring this point out about the thrust through because it's normally an argument amongst the Jewish rabbis that uh, doesn't actually say pierced. You know, thrust through and pierced really are the same, but also he was thrust through with the spear. Uh, I kind of find it interesting about the spear because when they did, that's what caused the water to come out of his side, separated from his blood, which to me represented the fact that the waters of life were inside of him and it released the spirit of God that was in him that could come back upon the believer or the Holy Spirit that we're to receive. So at any point, I wanted to bring that out to you. So anyway, so we have this here. Um, the different families that come back, Shimei, and all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart, which were the Samaritans. Samaritans have always been in Israel. They've never left from what uh, history has, has told us, taught us about this. So, but, but anyway, so the point is, uh, our people were scattered for a purpose. And, and one thing I wanted to mention to you, let's see if I can bring this out real quick here. Um, Okay, uh, there's actually a scripture here, and I, and I missed where it's at. Um, a burden of stone, let's see, for the people and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut off in pieces, and all the people of the earth shall gather together against it. In that day, saith the Lord. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's here in Zechariah 12. It's where he uh, promises to bring back... Um, 
Judah first. And the reason being is because he has to deal with Judah and their sins. Also, clearly we do see, though, in Zechariah 12 here, that Israel, he's bringing back only the tribes that were there present when Yeshua was here on the earth. Uh, the, the house of Israel does not have to come and look upon him whom they pierced because they weren't there. They weren't guilty of it. They, they had no part in that uh, to begin with, so therefore we don't see them there uh, in this particular instance here. Uh, so anyway, another thing I wanted to bring to your attention, and that is I, I meant to bring it out in the video the other day, was Ezra. Uh, just, re just as a reminder, Ezra was faced with the same problem that we're faced with today, and that is uh, that the leaders of Israel uh, in the Second Temple period had married into amongst the, the Babylonian daughters. Uh, so it, we find this in, in several different places here. Um, especially in chapter 9, verse 1. Now, uh, excuse me, now when these things were done, the princess came to, 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 to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, and even the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. Um, so quite frankly, that is true. And even today, uh, the Vatican is modern-day Babylon. And, you know, the, the, the natural Israeli citizen has really nothing to do with this two-state solution. I mean, there are some of them that are vocal that say, you know, we'd rather have the peace, get it, do whatever you got to do to make it happen. But for the most part, uh, we see a handful of rabbis that have embraced this. Uh, we see uh, uh, a handful of politicians that are courting the Vatican, especially Shimon Perez being definitely one of the guilty ones in this regards here. Uh, Miss Lavini also, there was another lady that's in the... Uh, uh, that's in the uh, Israeli parliament that uh, was very uh, strong supporter of the Vatican and this two-state solution. Um, so we have today the guilt upon our hands for allowing Rome basically to get control of Israel once again. Now, that's what I have said that has really inflamed a couple of people. Uh, but the thing is, what you don't understand, God is resetting up the whole scenario the way it was 2,000 years ago. See, you have to understand when Yeshua was here, even his own disciples were expecting him to deliver them from the hands of the Romans. But because he was going to be cut off, and not for himself, according to Daniel's prophecy, that when the anointed prince would come, he'd be cut off not for himself, but for the people, uh, that part of history kind of stopped. This is why we see in Daniel's prophecy that there would be a prince that shall come that would be of the people that destroyed this temple and the sanctuary. So what happens is history basically picks right back up where it got left off at. And Rome comes right back into power again. And Yeshua will actually come back on the scene. And he, this time he's going to deliver Israel from the Romans. This is the whole thing about where we read in the scripture that he takes uh, the hook in the Leviathan's mouth and draws him out. You know, now Leviathan, I think in a lot of cases, is believed to be Russia. God is not just dealing with the Vatican here, but the thing is, is God is going to bring all nations down. And but specifically, we see like in Gog and Magog that God brings nations down that were cruel to the Jewish people when the Jewish people were in their exile. But so many times, I mean, we have to, we have to acknowledge as the Jewish people, um, you know, we did not, the, the longest exile in our history has been the exile we've been in, 2,000 years away from the homeland. Um, had, had we been so righteous all this time, we would have already gone back to our homeland. This is not a coincidence. Uh, it's, it's not by chance uh, that we have been scattered the way we have been scattered. And it's not by chance that we're back in the homeland now the way we are. Um, 
God has known exactly when all these things would take place, what, what would take place, how it would take place. And, and so, I mean, just to share with you another scripture to prove this, God says here in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. Okay? God goes to his place returns there until we acknowledge our offense. Well, Israel still has not acknowledged the fact of the rejection of Yeshua. Watch what he says. Come, let us and return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow uh, on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain and the latter rain and the former rain unto the earth. Okay, when does he do this? After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now, if you take and count the time of the house of Israel going into captivity as well, 723 BCE, and you take the time that the house of Judah goes into captivity, and of course God does prophesy that the house of Judah is going to follow suit, but he, he accumulates the two times together and says in the third day he's going to revive us. But when is he going to revive us? After we acknowledge our offense. See? till they acknowledge their offense. Well, Israel's got to acknowledge, the house of Israel's got to acknowledge that they, they had gone into to idolatry. But the house of Judah has got to acknowledge that they rejected the Mashiach. So, we're in our homeland for a purpose. And soon, God is going to bring this all to a close. So, yes, Although the, the Vatican has is, is got a stronghold in Israel right now, it is a temporal stronghold. Um, just like I believe in the case of Ezra, Ezra, there was mercy for the leaders that did what they did. I still believe that the leaders that, um, that are under the coercion to do this or the monetary... Um, Let's put it this way here. There's a lot of pressure from the world on the Israeli government to make the concessions they're making. And because in many cases, the brothers do not recognize, or, and the sisters do not recognize, that God's hand and mercy is upon us and that He will stand for us no matter what, they still make decisions from a fleshly point of view. All they see is this great, big, massive world that hates the Jews, that are against the Jews. They see the Vatican... Uh, who is a false peacemaker, but the Vatican, believe me, a very um, uh, slick, evil organization uh, that does everything by threats. We clearly have where the Vatican told certain rabbis that if you don't give us back uh, the properties that we had in Israel before you came along, we will not guarantee the safety of your families. Um, that's pretty much a threat. I mean, if anybody <laughs> recognizes threats anymore. So, but Revelation 11 says that they're going to tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months. These uh, Gentiles are. Somebody's got to do it then. If the scripture is going to be fulfilled. Which Gentiles? You think it's going to be the Palestinians? It can't be the Palestinians. The Palestinians were under there a lot longer than 42 months. Who is the one that has not had control of Israel since the days when Yeshua was there? The Romans. That's exactly right. So here we've had all these different people. We've had the British. We've had the Turks. Uh, Rome had it until Rome was destroyed. Or excuse me, until Rome destroyed Israel. And of course, everything got took over. So it's a future prophecy. And it can't be the Palestinians because when... Israel got there, they were dealing with these Palestinians for the last, uh, in fact, and from 1948 to 1967, the Palestinians were living in Jerusalem. So it's not a 42-month period for them. It has to be a specific Jew and Gentile people that have not had any control over Israel for a period of time until now. And we're seeing unfold right before our eyes that the Vatican is actually getting control of the holy city. 
Uh, and let me just read that to you one more time so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Revelation chapter 11. And I'm going to do a little bit more research for you because I believe that there's other passages that will point us to it. I don't think Revelation is the only one. I do know in Ezekiel 35, Ezekiel 35 also uh, alludes to this as well. When it says that these two nations, that he's going uh, to take these two nations, this was the evil in, in the Vatican's heart. But it says clear, clearly here, but the court, verse 2, which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, when I was challenged on the Vatican getting control, I was told that this was basically heresy that I was saying that I'm speaking against Israel. Um, and that it's only Shimon Perez that's the bad guy. Well, I don't think Shimon Perez controls the police force, nor the military, but right now it's the police force and the special forces. Uh, that's exactly what, uh, in fact, I put the picture of it up as well in the last video, the special forces there at the tomb of David, enforcing to allow the Vatican's people to come and hold a mass in the tomb of David. Um, we don't see the Palestinians getting away with that. No, they're not getting to go do that. Uh, so what I'm saying is the holy city is what I consider to be the city of, you know, the, the old ancient city, which goes out beyond the walls that the Turks have. So how much more control are they going to get and how much more are they going to get away with and how much more are they going to push Jews out of the way? According to Micah, we're going to be sent out of the city and have to dwell in the fields before long. And even Micah declares that we're under a tremendous travail. So we don't want to be under the illusion as Jewish people that it's just going to be a flower bed of ease. We've got some tough times ahead. But the one thing's for sure, God is about to deliver his people. He is about to deliver his people. The coming of the two witnesses, I believe what will really straighten out a lot of this mess. However, one other point that may be contentious as well, I don't think all the Jews are going to believe the two witnesses either. In fact, it'd be kind of odd for all of them to believe because if they did, I don't think they would let them be killed. But they sure stir up something, something bad enough that the Vatican has them killed. Which brings us to another point. When are they coming and when would they be killed? I say that because the Vatican clearly is only going to be given 42 months to tread over, this, over the old city there. Then the covenant will be broken. It almost stands to reason that they would come near the beginning of this covenant. Because once the covenant is broken, Israel is going to go against everything and everybody. And Israel will, as Micah puts it, they will, they will turn their, 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 their plows into swords and their feet into hooves of brass. And they will beat their enemies down. At that time, they would actually protect the two witnesses. I'm afraid, though, that the death of the two witnesses is what causes the Jews to recognize that they have deliverance. And that's where they break their covenant. When they see them raised to their feet and know that assuredly God sent them as a witness of the resurrection, that Yeshua indeed was indeed Mashiach. I'm Stephen Bendenun with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. We love you. God bless you. And trust this has been a blessing. Good night. Laila Tov.